Hey everybody, I'm Francesca Maxime and this is Wise Girl for October 25th, 2018. And again, Wise Girl is not about me being the wise person, although as I do get older and become more of the elder, <laughs> I'd like to say that I'm cultivating some wisdom, but it really is about that. It's about the cultivation of wisdom in the guy or the girl in you. And I do like to sort of use it as a play on words to sort of say that there is a girl or guy a little one in us oftentimes that can be quite wise, that oftentimes um, we don't pay as much attention to as we could. So who is that little wise one in us and where are we going to take them today? So today for our Wise Girl uh, podcast, we have Mark Matusik with us. He is an amazing writer and friend and the author of this book, um, among many, Writing to Awaken, A Journey of Truth, Transformation, and Self-Discovery. And he's often here in New York, but he teaches all around the world, writing workshops uh, that integrate memoir writing, spiritual practices, self-discovery, and a whole variety of things. Um, the author of two award-winning memoirs, Sex, Death, and Enlightenment, an international bestseller, and The Boy He Left Behind, a Los Angeles Times discovery book, as well as When You're Falling, Dive, and Ethical Wisdom. Uh, he collaborated with Sogyal Rinpoche on the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, Andrew Harvey on Dialogues with the Modern Mystic, and Ram Das on Still Here, and I th believe also has a new book about Mother Mira out. Mark, welcome. Thanks for joining me on Wise Girl. Thank you, Francesca. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. Um, I know that you're offering some new upcoming classes and stuff, uh, you know, as you always are traveling all around the world, including uh, a new one that's coming up, I believe, in, in Europe. Um, but that one, I think, is based on this book, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that, because we've worked together a couple of times. I've taken a couple of your, um, of your workshops. And Mainly what I appreciate about your approach is I am a poet and, you know, have used writing and poetry as a way for me to help decalcify some of whatever's stuck in me or things that I want to, you know, look at in a different way. Talk to me a little bit about your own personal journey. You were a journalist, as I was, and then you sort of had your come to Jesus moment, if it were, as I did, and then you kind of moved from sort of asking outside, uh, you know, people questions about their lives to looking more inside and really digging down deep and, and asking yourself those questions and then sort of doing, you know, reporting from the inside out, if you will. Mm. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, sort of when that happened and, 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 and how that then has blossomed into now what has become your very purposeful work. That was a profound moment for me after being a reporter and an editor for years in New York. Uh, I, was report, I was doing a story uh, and realized that the subject I was writing about had very personal uh, resonance for me and repercussions in my own family. And I was faced with this, you know, this question, am I going to open the door? Am I actually going to write about myself? And when I decided that to not do so would be very dishonest, uh, I discovered a whole world of possibilities in terms of my own work. When I discovered the first person pronoun and I actually allowed myself to write about my, my life, uh, it, it changed my work completely. Uh, it brought me to my, my practice in terms of writing to awaken. Uh, and, it has actually, and it has made me a, a more um, honest and transparent writer. Uh, whatever it is I'm, I'm doing or teaching, I'm on the line as well. I'm, I put myself out there so that when I'm asking people to explore deep questions, things that may be challenging, uh, they can open my book and say, well, this guy's done it. You know, I'm not, I'm not, just, I'm not just preaching. Uh, and it gives, makes, creates a camaraderie with my students and the people I work with that, that I love. So it's not a hierarchical thing. I see myself as a spiritual friend, a guide, a mentor. Uh, but I'm absolutely a seeker on the path like everybody else. Uh, and that's what creates good memoir is, is allowing the process to be uh, open and, and s letting the reader know that you're, you know, that you don't have all of the answers, that you can be a mess, that you're still looking. And that's very, that's what creates the connection, the heart connection with the reader, I find. 
I love that because really what you're describing is this process of awakening, right? Mm. And, and a lot of people say, especially in spiritual communities, mindfulness communities, sometimes Buddhist communities, oh, you know, I want to reach enlightenment or enlightenment is so impossible to reach. I'm not even going to bother trying or I can just sort of flog myself in the meantime as I try to, you know, attain this unattainable state of enlightenment as I sit on my cushion and have my critical inner voice yap away at me and um, I'm really a terrible person and I'll never write anything worth writing or do anything worth doing and I'm just trying to do this for my my redemption perhaps and yeah. um, and it's very sad um, that that all that energy can be used in that way when it could really be used for something else yeah it is sad and redemption isn't a very inspiring uh, motivation on the spiritual path you know a lot of us come to spirituality wanting some form of redemption in the sense of finding ourselves remembering who we are having a sense of wholeness but if you're coming from a position of being fundamentally flawed uh, and fundamentally sinful, which many of us are taught in a Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, uh, then it, it, it tends to uh, be a self-fulfilling prophecy and folks never have enough. They never feel wise enough. They never feel good enough. Whereas if you uh, start out from a Buddhist perspective, uh, that our essential nature is good, that to be a human being is an enormous blessing uh, and that suffering comes from ignorance, not from some innate malice, that moves us along the path in a, in a way that is, you know, breeds curiosity and it breeds, um, it breeds self-belief. I don't know that it's possible to have a spiritual life over a long period of time, over the long run, without self-belief, without a genuine sense that you have the seeds of awareness already in you uh, and that you're not trying to find some big enlightenment thing out there somewhere. Uh, what we're doing is we're moving the obstacles to what's already within us. And for me, that's enormously inspiring. If I felt like I had to climb some mountain or attain some superpower that wasn't mine to begin with, mm, I don't know that I would be interested uh, in spirituality because it's, it would just be another form of self, self-loathing or, 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 or inducing low self-esteem. Who needs that? No, I mean, we're here to become bigger than we are, to expand, to get to know what we actually are capable of. And that's what true spirituality is about. So um, you're right. Redemption is not a great point of departure. Yeah, right. Because how can you be redeemed from anything if there wasn't anything wrong with you to begin with? That's the point. That's the point. Not feeling that we have to, we are children of creation. Call it God, call it Buddha mind, call it whatever you want. We are part of whatever the divinity of this world is. We're already part of that. Uh, and, and the idea that we come into this world flawed is so anti-God. Uh, it's so anti-spiritual. I mean, why would God or life create something that was inherently imperfect, that was inherently broken and flawed? It, it, it doesn't, go along with nature. Nature doesn't allow things that can't survive or that aren't fit uh, to, to uh, evolve to survive in nature. I mean, they, just, they simply don't stick around. The fact that we are here after all these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years proves that we have something in us that is, uh, that is sturdy and that is truly connected to, to nature uh, and, and the natural world and that we have this capability to awaken. And that's, to me, what makes life interesting. I love this because what you're talking about to me is this twofold approach, which is the one that I sort of stumbled on, but is very true for me. And it has been my, um, I don't know, it's been my sort of North Star, if you will, which mm. is there's nothing wrong with you and you have plenty of work to do. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're... Exactly. You know? <laughs> and both are true. And really living in both are true is the, is the bottom line of, of, of spiritual awareness. You know, getting that everything is paradox. Uh, it allows us so much leeway. Uh, and, and we don't think when our shadows come up, we don't automatically think, oh, we're not worthy. No, we, are shadow, we have shadow, we have illumination, we have both. Uh, and, and like you said, they're, um, they can coexist. Until we can coexist with our own mess, with an awareness of our, our, of our essential goodness, we can't progress on the spiritual path because it's always a mess. So, so we have to allow, we, how can we be okay in the midst of the mess? To me, that's the essential question. 
And that's what this, that's what writing is so great for is to sort of find our way through momentary confusion and say, what, where am I now? Writing can really help us discover uh, the truth about what's going on for us at any given moment. And that's what leads us to, you know, to more freedom and, and happiness, well-being. And I love that um, we're shifting to the writing piece because clearly that's what your expertise is in. And we're going to talk now about that because I think that it's interesting if you're looking at things from, say, the Buddhist path or the mindfulness path or Buddhist psychology, um, pretty much the Buddha said, you know, ehi pasiko, come and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go out there and try it and see what you think. And if it's different, then, you know, whatever I say, then don't take my word for it. You know, believe yourself, believe your own experience. Right. Um, but the writing is, in fact, an experiential process. Mm -hmm. And it's one that can get us out of, you know, the swinging trees and limbs of our monkey mind, so to speak, onto the page, where we kind of do create that metacognition or dual awareness because we can sort of witness our own thoughts and I won't even say behaviors, but our own, our own mind at work, if you will, by putting it on a page in a way that sometimes it just gets like scrambled eggs up in here and, and, and we can't really make sense of, of, of what's in here. Not that it's bad if it's scrambled, but just that, you know, whatever it is that we don't have an ability to see it. So talk to me about how writing does get you down through the shale into that core of your own inner goodness that you spoke of when we started our conversation. Well, you put your finger on it when you mentioned the word witness, uh, because as in meditation, it, it's the ability to observe our own minds, our feelings and our thoughts that gives us insight. Uh, so by externalizing these, the thoughts that are going on in our minds onto the page and really seeing what it is that we believe in black and white uh, and, and at a distance, that's what brings the aha. Uh, and that's what touches us into that part of ourselves that actually knows much, much more than we're aware of. That witness self knows, knows uh, is the seat of knowledge. It's actually the source of our, of our deep knowledge. And I see this all the time with students when uh, I'll give them a question to a prompt, a challenging prompt, and they'll begin by saying, I have no idea what to say. I'm completely confused. I'm ignorant. I'm suffering. My life's a mess. And they write their way through it. And by the end of the peace, almost invariably, Francesca, they're speaking with this wise mind. They've deduced, it's like, the, it's like all of the stuff has fallen down and they're able to, to come through. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The tone by the end of a piece versus the beginning, to me, is a metaphor for our lives. So in the same way that we witness ourselves in meditation, uh, we sit there, we practice day by day. We don't wait for a, to be in a good mood to sit down and, and meditate. In the same way, we can use writing as a kind of emotional and spiritual hygiene. Uh, whether or not we're feeling like doing it, sit down for 20 or 30 minutes uh, in the morning and pose an essential question to yourself and watch what happens. Watch how it brings you to life. Watch how you start to look at, you see things differently. Okay. By, the end, by the end of the writing, there will be a shift. Devil's advocate, right? Um, so problem number one or question number one or obstacle number one or perceived obstacle number one. I don't know how to write. I've never write, written. I'm not a writer. Yeah. Um, go you, there do, you do not have to be a writer to, to do this practice at all. Writing is a vehicle. Writing is the tool uh, that, that we use for self-investigation. Uh, you don't have to be a, a, a gymnast to sit on a cushion and, and, and straighten your back and be able to and you don't have to be a writer to put your, your thoughts and feelings into language. The thing is that people are taught that being a writer is this special thing. Uh, and, and that unless you're born to it, you are, uh, you know, you're, you, it's going to be a major challenge. You're going to embarrass yourself. If you can write an email, you can do this work. It's about telling the truth. It's about daring yourself. It's about taking risks. And it's really about being transparent on the page in a way that we can't be in our lives because we move through our lives with so many cover-ups, so many lies, so many, you know, so many uh, prevarications of, of, of different kinds, that when we finally sit down with ourselves and we can drop the mask, it's a huge relief. And it's often a big surprise to people what's really there. I love that. And, and so the second obstacle is, is I don't want to open Pandora's box and find out what's really there. I'm afraid. I'm even afraid to admit I'm afraid. So I'm going to be angry instead of being afraid, or I'm going to be 
self-blaming or I'm going to be depressed. Um, not that depression is really a choice, but I'm going to be sad, if you will, um, and, and, and internalized and, and just sort of shut down. Uh, yeah. um, so, you know, number two. <laughs> number two is write about the anger. I write about the fear. If you're afraid of opening Pandora's box, write about the fear. If you feel blocked, write about the block. Um, what, what, what is the fear actually? What are you, what's the story behind the fear? What do you think is the uh, worst outcome here? What is the thing that you're most uh, fearful about exposing? Uh, and ease your way toward it. Because a life closed, if you keep Pandora's box closed, uh, you, you have, your life isn't worth living, as, as Plato said. You know, if we are not willing to examine what's going on, then we never wake up. We never access our own potential. Uh, and we can move through our lives, as many people do, strangers to themselves. You know, this is what first got me on a spiritual path, is I realized when I was diagnosed with a, what was supposed to be a fatal disease in my late 20s, that uh, I was completely ignorant and I was not going to die ignorant. I said, I'm not going to like stumble off the cliff like a, like a, a sleepwalker here. If I'm going, not going to be here, uh, then at least I want to know something when, when I die, when I have some sense of who I truly am. That's what got me on the spiritual path. And mortality, of course, gets a lot of people uh, on the path. But if I hadn't done that, I would have been a stranger to myself. And, and many people are so afraid of actually knowing themselves in the, in the round. This is about understanding and accepting ourselves in the round and making space for all of it because we realize we are not the circumstances. We're not the mess. We're not ultimately our thoughts and our feelings and our, our, our situation. We are the observing consciousness. And that part of ourselves is always free. And what writing does like meditation is reminds you of that observing power of consciousness that's always there. Uh, and because the more you do this work uh, as a writer, you know, using this practice, the more you see your life in, in uh, technicolor. You know, you really are willing to see rather than, we, rather than sort of blinkering ourselves and dimming everything out because it's too scary. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm just noting the microphone is rubbing against your collar a little bit. So okay. maybe pull it up just sure. a tiny bit. Sure. Yeah. Tiny bit. Yeah. Um, perfect. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yep, just a tiny bit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about this as a block to the fear and the people who might be angry or who might otherwise not really want to be opening Pandora's box and and then finding that 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 the wisdom is really um, you know underneath that all, um, I feel like there's some people that really are in this place where if I put it on the page, that makes it real. And if I don't put it on the page, it's not real. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is the same as what you just said, but I don't think it is. I think this is more like this piece of, I really can't believe that this would be real. Mm -hmm. And putting it on the page is just not only frightening, but terrorizing and paralyzing. Yes. Yeah, no, it, and it is for people because it, it uh, makes magical thinking impossible. You know, it, it actually, you know, it stops magical thinking. The part of us that if I don't say it, it's not real, is the part of us that keeps us trapped. That is our nemesis. Just don't say it, just don't speak it, just don't tell the truth, and you, you, can, you can pretend. And we live so much of our lives in this pretending place. And writing is about waking up from that trance uh, of pretense and saying that it's okay that we, um, we have questions, it's okay that we have fears, we are larger than these fears. Those fears, are not, those, those fears do, not, uh, do not limit us. So it, it's getting bigger than the fear. And the way we do that is by looking directly at the fear. Of course, that's the trick. The closer you get to fear, the less power it has over you. So I always ask people, what is, when they say, oh, I'm terrified of doing that, I say, Let's talk about what is the terror? What is it actually? And when they start to anatomize their own fears, what people often realize is they're not as scared as they thought they were. It's the story. It's this never ending story in the mind saying, you're too scared, you're too scared, you're too scared. And we never stop to ask ourselves, what are we actually afraid of? And is it true that we're so scared or is that an old idea? Is it just a vestigial, like a phantom limb that we think is there, but when we go to touch the fear, we're not as scared as we thought we were. Yeah, no, I love that. And, and, I, and I do think that one of the funniest things is it's sort of like the emperor has no clothes. 
Right. And, 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 and the other thing is, um, it, that's sort of coming to mind is in some ways, the boy who cried wolf in the sense that it's sort of like that we have this, you know, need, whatever our needs are that we feel like we shouldn't have, or we have desires that we feel like we shouldn't have, mm. or we have ideas that we feel like we aren't allowed to have. And that a lot of this, of course, is based on what we were told when we were younger or by society or our family, but that putting them on the page might actually open us not only away from the grip of the tightness of the fear of the past, but God forbid, open us up to the possibility of a new freedom and a new mobility and a new engagement and delight with life. And then the fear is around what would it mean to actually go there? I don't know. Exactly. And that really is true. People are scared of a happiness. People are scared of fulfillment. They're scared of freedom. You know, I often ask people, what would you do if you were free? However you define freedom. And it sort of blows their, their minds. Uh, we are scared of possibility. And that's why it's easier to hide out in I can't or whatever the wound is and, and uh, you know, tell ourselves that story than it is to open ourselves to the, you know, to all of the choices. You know, choice is choice can be a scary thing, but until we step into our own choice, we have no, we can't create meaning in our lives and we can't, we can't have the life that we were born to have. So let's talk a little bit about um, the writing as a practice, meaning that you can do it, you know, on, on the regular, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also any ideas that people may have about that, right? Like I can't do it every day or I won't do it every day or I'm a bad person if I do it every day, whatever. And then the other piece is um, maybe walk us through some of the exercises you were starting to do earlier, um, you know, just some of the basic introductory things that you might invite people as a, a writing prompt. For those of you who aren't writers, a prompt is just sort of a, a little piece of direction about what you might want to write about. And a teacher like Mark might give you a half an hour or so to, to do such a thing. So. Right. right. Well, first of all, about writing every day. Ideally, uh, 20 minutes in the morning would be fantastic. Most people can't commit to seven days. So I tell people in the beginning, 20 minutes a day, five days a week. Just commit to that for, for a month and see what, how you feel after those 20 uh, sessions. Um, it, it doesn't, it, there, is no, uh, there is no strict rule around this. It's about what we need and what we're capable of and what appeals to us. Uh, which is why I also say to people, if you can't uh, commit to a regular practice, forget, don't feel bad about it. Just remember the next time you're in a, in a quandary, the next time you're in crisis, the next time you're in some bad place that's, that's, you know, that, that you can't find your way out of, write about it. Just use the practice in, in those moments when, you, when, it's, when it's most needed, uh, if you can't do it on a regular basis. Uh, so in terms of, what, uh, of uh, where I start with people, a question I usually ask at the beginning is, uh, to write about a story you tell yourself on a regular basis that you know isn't true. Mm -hmm. A story you tell on a regular basis that you know isn't true. And How would you know it isn't true if you keep telling yourself that? Because we all know, most of us know when we're lying to ourselves. All right, give me an example. Okay. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a friend who... Um, uh, is not good with picking up the phone or staying in touch. Uh, and that's something that, that I, you know, that I struggle with sometimes. So the story I often tell myself is uh, that he doesn't care enough. Uh, he isn't um, sensitive enough, et cetera, et cetera. I know that's not the case. The case is that this person is in a place in his life right now where he's absolutely beside himself and always, always overwhelmed. That's the truth and I know it is. But that old story about abandonment, not paying attention, where are they? That goes deep. That has, that has in my own life, that has deep roots. So there's a default story that happens when I know it isn't true. And it's easy to, rem to, to believe it. It's, I, it's, I, it's a very easy thing. What's harder to believe is what I know to be true, which is that this person loves me. This has nothing to do with me. Uh, and, uh, and if I remembered that I would be, I would not suffer. I would not suffer, nor would I blame. And I would be able to increase the, uh, the intimacy between us. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a, a, 
that's yeah, one no, example. That's a beautiful example. You said so many things in there that I want to ask you about. And, and one of them is, in fact, about your dad and your childhood, because mm -hmm. I know you've written about that before. Mm -hmm. And um, and how are early experiences in that way? Um, you mentioned, you know, sort of abandonment. A lot of people feel like they're going to, you know, they're, they're always on the lookout for being abandoned or rejected. They don't realize that, like, I can't actually be abandoned now because I'm an adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay more okay than not okay right yeah, yeah. But when i'm believing the story about myself that i could have been abandoned then if i didn't do everything just right to survive which is totally legitimate right as a kid right right that i you know wouldn't have love i didn't deserve love i wouldn't be whatever so mention how that finds its way not only through your own writing as it has but um when you invite people in to start looking at stuff and and some of this stuff that's very old that's been very much um uh you know the unintentional compass of people's lives or the roadmap i should say um yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. Not the compass um how that plays out when they end up doing their workshops with you and um they start digging deep yeah it's so helpful because what people often find is that the questions that have been dogging them, haunting them throughout their lives are connected to an early wounding of some kind or sometimes multiple woundings. And when we realize that we've been using our wound as the compass in our lives, uh, to use your, your, your image, when you use the wound as the compass, you're going to be led in directions that are painful, that repeat the wound, that are, you know, that are some kind can be traumatizing. Uh, so when we examine the wound in this work uh, and finally confront those initial breaks, those initial wounds, those primal places where we're hurting, um, then those, uh, those conditions don't have the same power to manipulate us because we've taken it out of the shadow, we put it in the light, we said, okay, I was, for example, abandoned, uh, and we can start to make the connections in our lives that can stop those behaviors that are, that are about repeating what we believe to be true. Because then that's what we do. It doesn't matter how harmful it is to us. We will believe, we will continue and repeat what we believe to be true. We'd rather do that than take a chance on the unknown. So it's extremely important to look in the basement and see what's there. You know, otherwise, we, as I was saying earlier, we're strangers to ourselves. And also when we do that, Francesca, it connects us to other people because uh, I'm not the first person to be abandoned by, by his father. Uh, and, and, and when I wrote about it, for example, in that book, it was very powerful for people from many, many different walks of life who, had, who were felt uh, abandoned by, uh, by a parent, not even necessarily just a father. So when you go into your own uh, depths, you touch humanity. It becomes, uh, it becomes archetypal. Uh, it's not even personal. And that's what, that's what re that's, comes as a relief because it gets us out of our, our stuff and this feeling sorry for ourselves or feeling like we're something, something wrong with us because we have this wound. Yeah, I love that because it does go full circle to the beginning of the conversation about like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're inborn with this, you know, out of the womb, this inner dignity and nobility as one of my teachers um, often uh, sort of, you know, says it as. And, and yet, um, there, we do feel like we are what's happened to us or what our condition or experience is as opposed to touching back into that other place. But in the sharing of it, if you're willing to go there into the, you know, sort of get out the jackhammer and go down the shale and, you know, discover whatever it is, in the sharing of it, when you realize that you're in good company, <laughs> you have a big whole community of other people who have unfortunately perhaps suffered the same thing, but that that thing once brought to light can be not only what connects you, but my mom likes to say, you know, your wound is your vein of gold. Yes, it is. So oh, can you is. talk about that, like how sometimes when we're willing to do the excavation and, and kind of um, bring it up and then, and then share it, but sometimes that can bring a new depth or a new level of um, purpose, um, not only to our lives, but um, addition to the world in a way. No question about it, because we're standing on our experience. Uh, and 
until we understand what that experience has been, we're not going to be able to connect with other people and we're not going to be able to connect with our lives and with the, with the greater world. We have to understand how we came to where we are. We need to know what the content is. And your mom is absolutely right about the wound being the vein of gold. I love that. Uh, I, when I, for, for myself, I mean, I, I can directly trace the line from my childhood with all the stuff that happened there to being a memoir writer, to being interested in other people's stories, to doing the work that I do now. There's an absolute organic line between those two things. I wouldn't have chosen the, the, the childhood I had by any means, trust me. But I love my life and I love the way it has evolved. So where's the bad news? I don't see any bad news. You know, provided you survive, one survives and the trauma stops and you remove yourself from the you know, areas where you're being hurt, we, you come out the winner. You come out deeper. You come out more sensitive. You come out more compassionate. You come out less scared because you've gone through a lot of stuff. And that's the other thing is people often don't, they don't um, reap the rewards of their own suffering by acknowledging how strong they actually have become. They stay in this victim uh, place instead of saying, my God, you know, look what I came through. Look who, look what I've done. Uh, and when we remember that, it puts everything else in proportion. And we take, we take um, residence in ourselves. We take you know, real ownership of, our, of ourselves. But in order to do that, we have to look into where, you know, where we have been broken. I love that. We take residence in ourselves. I love that. Mm. Um, so two things. One is, um, again, maybe introducing some kind of a writing prompt or practice that you might give someone. Like what could they expect if they wanted to take one of your workshops? I know you offer different ones, some online, some in person, some at various retreat centers, some at more academic settings and all of that. And then I also wanted to ask a little bit more, um, maybe after you answer that, about patriarchy and the Me Too thing and just sort of men in general and whether or not um, as, a, as a man, especially in this Western culture, we're a little more conditioned to cut off from this piece that we're talking about because of the way society has constructed this idea of what is otherwise, um, you know, on yin and yang, or the yang energy, for lack of a better word. But well, there's, yeah, there's no question. So starting with, with your first question about what I'm teaching, or I'm really focused these days on creativity. I'm interested in the relationship between desire, creativity, and self-fulfillment, self-realization. That's what really interests me. So everything I'm teaching in 2019 is about creativity in some way. Uh, as far as the man thing, it's something that I was born into because I grew up in a house full of women. My father left when I was very young. Uh, and it was a hard thing for me to accept myself as a man in a house where men were the culprits, men were the villains, men were the sons of bitches. Uh, and when you actually are that yourself, it's hard to it's hard to you know, figure out how you can be a good person if the people around you or by the nature of your sex, you are, you are evil or you are dangerous. So for me, I, was, I feel like I was born into the Me Too movement and then I've gotten more involved. My friend Eve Ensler wrote a play called Vagina Monologues and uh, asked me to be part of her organization V-Day uh, to start something called V-Men because we realized till men were in the conversation, nothing was going to change. So I was able to, I've been able to talk to men about their uh, fears of their own violence, their uh, feelings toward women, because not surprisingly, men have a lot of anger toward women for some legitimate reasons uh, in their own lives. It doesn't get to be expressed because women sometimes take the, um, the moral high ground and say, wait a minute, you know, I, for example, I was at a conference speaking and I started to talk about I was on a panel, I started to talk about how men feel misunderstood and people got furious at me. The women started you know, yelling at me and we're the, you know, we're the ruling class, we don't have the, we're not here to complain about men, we're here to talk about women. And it was for me emblematic of the attitude uh, among some feminists regarding men's suffering. Because if you don't allow men also to have their suffering, uh, and if you can't separate good men or men who don't commit violence from men who do, then you're just being as stereotypical and sexist as you're accusing men of being. You know, the, the, and most, the, you know, 99% of the men in the world would not think of committing violence. That may be an exaggeration, but a high percentage. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and it's it's awful sometimes to feel lumped into you know, to feel kind of thrown into the dust heap with the rest of the rest of the men when when it, when you're fighting for the very opposite. Well, you know, it's funny because polyvagal theory, Stephen Forges is going to be on the podcast soon, and um, he talks about safety and everything being about safety, and basically um, a, a, a way of um, remaining safe is um, for a lot of men, based on the way that they're socialized in our culture, not the way they come out of the womb, mm -hmm. is to um, sort of be many ways, you know, one of the guys in ways that um, they themselves may feel as though they are betraying their own self in order to be one of the guys, but that that's something that they have to do in order to um, survive in society and achieve whatever it is that we have uh, been proscribed as our, you know, levels of uh, necessary advancement, for lack of a better word. Now, of course, that's a totally different model. That's a hierarchical, patriarchal model than a more uh, model that you described even as a, as a teacher, like you said, where you see yourself as a, mm. uh, someone who is co-creating and sharing mm. and, and generating and receiving and all of that, and that one doesn't beget the other, meaning you don't have to sacrifice this idea of this other, like I said earlier, the yang energy, um, only to be yin. You're not soft, quote unquote, if you're, no. you know. So can you talk a little bit about that sort of split inside? You know, Carol Gilligan talks about it, Terry, a lot of these folks that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the split inside and for men and the men suffering inside in that way and where we can meet it now because mm -hmm. of this sort of me too and, and, and that there are women who are angry and sure they're angry at some of the right things for sure for a lot of reasons but what can we do to heal and what can men who aren't abusers and who aren't offenders how can they join in mm. ways like you just mentioned with Eve Ensler and that group mm. well the what we can do is step up uh, but that means accepting and being willing to look at our own vulnerability and the parts of ourselves the feminine in ourselves that we have been raised and trained very hard to stamp out. The worst thing you can say to a little boy is don't act like a girl. And so the first time any little boy gets told don't act like a girl when he's crying or when he's scared or when he's quiet or whatever it happens to be, that child develops an aversion to their own feminine uh, side or that part of themselves that isn't macho, that isn't male in that, in that way. And when that happens thousands and thousands of times over the course of a child's lifetime, when they get that message as a little boy that to be a girl is the worst thing you could possibly be, uh, you live in a world of opposites. You live in a world where I can't be that. I'm going to go as far as I can over in the other direction so that I'm not threatened by that. I'm not reminded about that. And it's a place of terrible suffering for men. And it, and it also makes love impossible. You know, that's the other thing is people wonder why, you know, why men are noncommittal. You know, often men are noncommittal because they have a deep distrust of the emotional life in general, not only women's, but also their own. So to love, we have to be, allow ourselves to be emotional. And for men, that, that means, you know, allowing for that softness and that stuff that they've been, you know, that spending their whole lives suppressing uh, to not only come out, but to be a part of their the conversation, you know, for a man to be in a relationship with a woman who wants to have emotional conversations. It's not like that you, you let that femininity out and then you can go back in. She wants your presence. She wants you to be intimate in, in that way that is so incredibly threatening because it is, it, it's emotional. Uh, it has nothing to do with machismo. Uh, the thing that I love is that as men allow themselves to, uh, to express their own feminine natures, uh, more, they can also claim their masculinity. You know, there, there's a beautiful expression they, they call it the tenderness of wolves. You know, that, that, that you can still be a man, but you can be tender uh, and you can be judicious about your aggression and you can be, you know, self-aware uh, without losing any of your strength. And this is so important, something I've learned in my own life and something I've learned from working with the men I, uh, through, through V-Men is that true strength has fragility in it. It has to. 
It's like pride has humility in it. If they don't, it's not real strength and it's not real pride. You know, true strength has to be able to bend. It has to be able to admit its mistakes, you know, and it, it, it has to be able to, to be weak sometimes. And that's something for men that can be so incredibly threatening. And once again, I have to say that women don't always make it easy for men to express their weaknesses. The last thing many women want is a weak man. You know, that, and, and, I have, and, and I've heard women, I've overheard women actually talking about men being too soft. And I really want, you know, all he does is talks about his feelings or, you know, he's, he's, he's just too, he's too um, sensitive. And men pick up those signals and they say, okay, well, you can't have it both ways. So either I'm going to be a macho, you know, jerk, or you're going to have to put up with me in my complexity. And, and men are taught not to be complex. We're taught to be one, you know, monolithic, to stay the course, to be strong, to show one clear, uh, strong face. And um, that's what the world expects of us. And that's, that's, that's a tough role to play. You know, it's no picnic trying to be a man in a society where you're supposed to cut half of yourself out and, and, and just be a kind of a, a mask or a stereotype instead of a real person. Yeah, it's just cutting off parts of yourself and, you know, eventually you're sort of like a stump and then what, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so if you're writing classes that you offer, do you work with men differently or do you offer, you said B-Day, you're doing men's groups there. Um, you know, I've, I'm just curious how you would encourage men who are interested in getting in touch with the inner self that is within them, their wise guy, as it were, um, and, and, and going from that fragmentation, that dissociation, that splitting off and cutting off, to more of that integration mm. and more of that cohesion that can then, you know, from which that, that mix of vulnerability and strength um, can come, you know, sort of more an embodied presence that can really respond wisely to life um, for themselves and, and also to the others that they care about and interact with in their lives? Well, the first thing you do is to look at the obstacles to authenticity. Uh, if a man wants to be authentic, if a man wants to uh, bring that part of himself forward, he needs to look at what the obstacles are to bringing it forward. What are his fears? What are his stories about what being a man is? Uh, when has he felt uh, ashamed or humiliated by women? That's a huge thing for men. Uh, particularly sexually, you know, I mean, there's a performance thing where we isn't talked about a lot, but it has major impact on sexual dynamics. The, the actual biology of sex affects psychological relationships between men and women. That's not something that is talked about very much. Um, so men have to look at the parts of themselves uh, that, where they feel closed off or scared uh, and explore them by whatever means. I recommend writing because you can do it anytime, it's free, and you can become your own guide. You strengthen your own wisdom consciousness when you, uh, when you do it yourself. Uh, but of course, you can do it in therapy, you can do it in many, other, in many other modalities, but you need to look at where the blocks are, where are the doors closed, uh, one by one, uh, and be honest with yourself. And what are some of the prompts you would give people to do that in your writing workshops? Mm. I, would ask, uh, I would ask men, first of all, to talk about what they learned about being a man when they were a little boy. You know, what, what were you, the earliest messages that you received? You know, what, 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 what did you observe in your household between your parents? What were the sexual dynamics like? Uh, and, and what, 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 what were your, what did your parents expect of you in terms of your gender? You know, how did they kind of keep you in that, in that block, in that box? Um, as, uh, major, uh, feminist man, Ted Bunch called, he said, he calls it the man box. You know, how did you, how did you, how was your man box constructed? What's it made of? Oh, it's made of my mother's criticism. It's made of what that person said to me in elementary school. It's made of a movie I saw where a, a, a sissy got beaten up. Whatever it is, these things are what create the man box. So we need to find our own way out of our own man box. And that comes from asking questions. Uh, and and that's, that's the, beauty of, uh, the beauty of writing to awaken. It, 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 go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, dear. 
Well, I guess, um, you know, we're, we're starting to close, but I, I guess I also want to say that this isn't exclusive to male, female gender, and it's not exclusive to sexual orientation around um, heterosexuality, right? Because I know that like Terry Real um, talks a lot about like women who offend from the victim position. He's one of my, you know, other mm -hmm. teachers and sort of like kind of what you were talking about, about the woman on stage or when you were on stage, you know, and, and not that there isn't a place for that righteous, you know, sort of anger, but the question is, what's the target? And is that really the, the right target? Um, or is, are you really trying to respond to an old target? So I just want to, again, be inclusive that this could be true in terms of a power dynamic or a, a, an adaptive strategy for anyone, regardless of the relationships that we're drawn to. Absolutely, absolutely. And women, this, has, this also con uh, connects to how women relate to their own masculine side, because a lot of women are taught to suppress the masculine because it's seen as too aggressive or it's seen as too competitive or it's seen as getting too big for themselves. Uh, and, and so we can all, men, women, straight, gay, old, young, uh, have, we all have power dynamics in our lives. We all have, they're all, they're all, there are hierarchies. There are places where gender or where sex uh, become an issue. So to just understand how the, how it's playing out through us so that we don't have to be victimized by it or manipulated by it. So yeah. many we're, we're stuck with the wagging of the tail to the dog of our own lives. That's exactly what happens. The tail wags the dog. That's, that's exactly what happens. The shadow material, which is the tail, wags the dog, which is the rest of us. So until we look in the shadow, until we understand where our weaknesses, our fears are, uh, we're going to be manipulated by these fears that we often don't understand. And so, so it's about facing what's actually going on so that we, so it's not so overwhelming. Yeah, I love that. I know I was teaching at Harvard um, on resilience and like mindfulness this spring. And, and one of the guys said, you know, when I was, you know, growing up, they just said, put some dirt on it. You know, yeah, yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. everything was like, put some dirt on it, you know, right. and, and, and the, the, the talk was originally going to be grit and bear it. And I said, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> the opposite you know so we went from that to resilience from surviving to thriving and so um you know that's really this process of writing to awaken that you're talking about is um cultivating this ability to really be um the observing wisdom the the witness you know uh, Joseph Goldstein, you know, big Buddhist Dharma teacher said, well, you're not just the witness, you know, it's, it's the knowing, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. of course, it's the knowing, it's the wisdom, you tap into it, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's there, and we forget that it's there. And then yes. the writing, just like a mindfulness practice is the remembering, exactly. literally, the remembering of our exactly. limbs that have been chopped by life. Yeah, yeah, that's beautifully said. And that is, that's exactly what it is. Plato called it anamnesis. It's remembrance of origin. It's remembrance of wholeness. It's remembrance of source. It's remembrance of connection. Uh, we all have that experience in us. We know what it feels like. Uh, and we suffer when we don't have it. So to look at the places where we feel cut off, fragmented, um, and, and rejected by ourselves and by other people uh, is the path to to connection and regeneration and, and remembering, a, 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 as you're saying. It's, once again, it's a paradox, but you don't get to the light, so to speak. You don't get to the good stuff without going through the basement. You know, we well, really, I, we do I, have to do that. I know, and I know for me personally, like as much as I was a seeker for much of my life, there were pieces that I, I think, you know, I was just ignorant about. Like I just did not, even though I was looking, maybe I wasn't quite looking in the right places. And, you know, you stumble along the way and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it cracks open and maybe you break your ankle on the sidewalk, but, you know, eventually, hopefully you get the cast on and you learn rehab and you move forward. And, you know, um, the last piece um, is mentioning your upcoming um, works uh, and your tours and your website and, and all of that and um, letting people know where they can find you. Oh. Well, people can uh, come to my website, which is markmatusic.com. Uh, and I have lots of stuff coming up. I'm going to be on the West Coast in January and February. I have a, an Italy retreat coming up in June that I'm very excited about. That's all about focusing creative intelligence and understanding how, how it works. So I invite people to, to, to uh, 
look at my stuff and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I also have an organization called the Seekers Forum uh, that I started in 2013. I give a monthly talk, it's free. And we have a great community all over the world uh, and, and, and really, I think, provocative topics, the kind of thing you're not gonna find in you know, church or temple or probably even in your therapist's office. So we've, we're, it's, uh, it's a great group. It's theseekersforum.com, one word. Uh, and I'd love to have uh, you know, folks join me there. Yeah, and your books are available you know, in the local bookstore or online or whatever. And, and the last piece that I just want to mention is I think a lot of people are afraid to write because they think writing is publishing. And they think yeah. writing is sharing. Can yeah. you touch on that before we close? And I promise that's the last question. Absolutely. It's not uh, publishing. It's self-witnessing. And you can't imagine how many people say to me how scared they are to write anything down because for fear of somebody might see it, which is what publishing, the fear of publishing is all about. So to, to, to really challenge that, that belief and, and understand also how we uh, use it as an excuse. You know, somebody might find my journal so I won't write. Uh, I mean, that is, and of course, people have had that experience happen. Uh, and it can be real and you have to deal with, with, with those feelings, but then you move on. The rest of it is paranoia. Uh, so trust, you know, understanding that this is for you alone. The beauty of this work is it's completely private. The reason I started writing when I was seven years old uh, is that it was the only place I could be completely myself, my secret place. It was the only off limits place I didn't have to wear, have to wear a mask. And that's what writing can be for people. That's why I love it so much. And that's why I like to share it. And you do it beautifully. Mark Matusik, thank you so much for your time today on Wise Girls. So appreciate it. And um, we'll share your gifts with the world. And I do hope that more people take your invitation and um, start to just practice this um, internal dialogue through um, putting things out on the page instead of just them, everything you know, being locked up inside. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you, Francesca. Thank you, Mark. Take care. Thank you.